Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the CSIC Distinguished Lecture. It's great to see so many of you here. Um, my name is Jennifer Schooling, and I, am, I have the good fortune to be the director of CSIC and work with a number of wonderful colleagues who are in the room today, and more importantly, to have worked with Robert for the last 10 years. Um, I am delighted to welcome you all to our CSIC Distinguished Lecture and to introduce our lecturer this year, who is none other than Professor Lord Robert Mayer himself, the founder of CSIC. Um, Robert is the Emeritus Sir Kirby Lang Professor of Civil Engineering and former Head of Civil and Environmental Engineering and is a Director of, the, of Research here at the University still. Um, I'm going to give you a fairly brief potted history, although there's a lot to talk about, so um, I will just give you a brief potted history of, of Robert's career. But he did read engineering here in Cambridge um, and some while after that came back and did a PhD here. Um, but prior to coming then, 27 years after that, he came back and um, took up a chair in Cambridge, having spent a long time working in industry. Um, and during his time in industry, he did a lot of very innovative things, uh, including becoming an authority on geotechnical engineering. And his particular speciality, as I'm sure most of you know, is the design and construction of tunnels. And his expertise has been sought throughout the world on numerous civil engineering projects involving soft ground tunnelling, retaining structures and deep excavations and so forth. Um, he is known for introducing the novel technique of compensation grouting for controlling settlement of structures during tunnel construction, um, which was introduced on the Waterloo Escalator Tunnel Project and has since been used all over the world um, to stabilise ground. It's a, a sort of a routinely used technique now. Um, and he's been asked to advise on civil engineering projects all over the world, including Amsterdam, Athens, Barcelona, Bologna, the list goes on, um, ending up with Warsaw, alphabetically. Um, he was also a member of the French Government Commission of Inquiry into the collapse of the Toulon Tunnel, and was co-chairman of Singapore Government's International Advisory Board on Design and Construction for Underground Metro and Tunnels from 2007 to 2014. Um, in this country, he was a member of Crossrail's engineering expert panel and is a member of the expert technical panel of our National Infrastructure Commission. On returning to Cambridge in 1998, he was appointed as a chair in engineering here at the university, obviously, um, where he championed industry-focused research and hence, you know, a lot of the collaborations and a lot of the people who are in the room today are our collaborators from industry. Um, and he grew the geotechnical environmental research group into one of the largest in the field in the world. He was, as I said earlier, the Sir Kirby Lang Professor of Civil Engineering from 2011 to 2017 and was Head of Civil Engineering, according to my notes, from 1999 to 2016. Is that correct, Robert? <laughs> um, and during this time, he was also Master of Jesus College for 10 years. I don't quite know how you did it all. Um, he also worked, um, was key to the establishment of both the Langer Rock Centre and CSIC here in 2010 and 2011. Um, he was elected as a Fellow of the Institution of Civil Engineers back in 1990 and a Fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering in 1992 um, and a Fellow of the Royal Society, no less, in 2007. For the geotechnical engineers in the room, he delivered the very prestigious Rankin Lecture in 2006 and the Hinton Lecture of the Royal Academy of Engineering in 2015. And if that wasn't enough, he was appointed Commander of the Order of the British Empire in the 2010 New Year's Honours. And on the 29th of October 2015, he was created a life peer in the House of Lords, where we are very grateful to him for speaking at length and authoritatively on issues concerning science and engineering. Um, and finally, you'll be pleased to hear Robert. <laughs> uh, Lord Mayor was elected a foreign member of the US National Academy of Engineering, which doesn't happen to many people, for his contributions to underground construction and smart infrastructure, and for his leadership in government, engineering practice, research and education. I give you our 2023 Distinguished Lecturer. Thank you very much. Jennifer, thank you very much. You said you were going to be brief. I'm so sorry you had to say so much. Thank you very much indeed, all of you, for coming. It's very nice. It's lovely to see so many colleagues and, and friends here. Um, I'm very proud to have been asked to give this Distinguished Lecture. Um, I am obviously very proud of CSIC, and so I'm going to give some reflections on 13 years of CSIC, and uh, you'll see the title, Infrastructure, Can't Measure, Can't Improve, with a question mark, and I hope by the end of my lecture you'll be able to answer that question yourselves. So, um, 
I'm going to really obviously quote Lord Kelvin. Quite a few of you have seen me quote him before. In 1883, he made this very important statement, if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. And that could not be more appropriate and more accurate uh, than in the case of infrastructure. So just to give an outline of what I'm going to speak about, I'm going to give a bit of background to CSIC because this is, in a sense, uh, an overview looking back over the 13 years. Um, and I'm going to focus principally on fiber optic sensing for field measurements, although there are many other things that CSIC have been doing. And I'm going to focus in that context on performance-based design improvements, construction control, performance of existing infrastructure assets, and early warning detection, those four aspects. And I will then finish saying some things about the future for smart infrastructure. The background to CSIC. This was an article in The Economist in 2010. Um, and the point of this article, it was a very good article, um, was all around sensors and, and using sensors and similar devices for bridges, tunnels, buildings, and so on. And the quote on the right-hand side, um, if a car can be made smart enough to spot when the oil is low or a brake light has failed, why not do the same for bridges, tunnels, and buildings? So right. And that was an impetus behind my friend and former colleague, Kenichi Soga, and I in um, making a large proposal to, to EPSRC, really encapsulating what we're seeing on that screen. And the background, the, our mission was to transform the future of infrastructure, uh, enabling better decision-making through smarter information. And our vision was to enable some step changes in construction practice and to extend asset life and reduce management costs. This was an extract from the proposal we put in in 2010 to EPSRC, that the centre will develop and commercialise emerging technologies which will provide radical changes in the construction and management of infrastructure, leading to considerably enhanced efficiencies, economies and adaptability. And behind all that was the notion of field demonstrations and case studies. And so it has proved to be the case. Uh, we, CSIC, over the last 13 years, has deployed novel sensors um, uh, on over 100 different construction sites. And what I'm going to do is to just give a taste of some of those. And as I said in the introduction, the, I'm going to focus principally on innovative fiber optic sensing for field measurements, which uh, has been a very important, in my view, a very important part of CSIC's activities and its success. There are many other things CSIC have been doing as well. Just to, as a recap for those of you who are not familiar with this, that if you launch light down an optical fiber, um, and we see the arrow we are, um, most of it, 98% of it gets transmitted, but a small amount gets backscattered and back to the original receiver, the, 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 the um, source of the light. And if the power is plotted against frequency, there are these different peaks. And this is quite complex physics. But the important point here is the, the Brillouin peaks are sensitive to um, changes in strain in, in the fiber. And so if you've got uh, a piece of fiber here and you've got a portion of it that has experienced strain and we plot the power against the frequency uh, with distance along the fiber, we can see a shift here. And this means that effectively the fiber is a continuous strain gauge and it can give you strain all the way along the fiber and it can, the fiber can be 
um, tens of meters, hundreds of meters, even kilometers in length, and you can spot exactly where the strain changes are and the magnitude of the strain. This um, uh, culminated. This work culminated in, a, in an excellent book uh, produced principally by Cedric Kechavazi, who I'm sad to say is not well and is not here today. But Cedric has really been terrific in leading the work on um, distributed fiber optic strain sensing. And this book, published by the ICE, has got a, some really good stuff in it. Uh, I commend it to you. Uh, case studies, mainly in geotechnical applications, tunnels, piles, diaphragm walls, slopes and embankments. But it's also very relevant to structures as well. And of course, some of those things are structures. They're structures interacting with the soil. So the first category that I mentioned in the introduction, performance-based design improvements. And I'm going to illustrate this by um, reference to some excellent work on shafts. And that excellent work was uh, undertaken by two of our former PhD students, Tina Schwamm and Angemilia Fausten. Angemilia is here today. And two very important case histories of large shafts, circular shafts, one for Thames Water at Abbey Mills, 70 meters deep, 30 meters diameter, the other for Crossrail. 44 metres deep, 30 metres in diameter. Different ground conditions. You'll see that the one on the right um, has almost no London clay. It's um, in quite different ground conditions. It's out towards the east of London, whereas the, the Limo Peninsula one is very much more in London clay. So what Angemilia did, and, her, and with, with a lot of uh, help from her CSIC colleagues, is install uh, fiber optics in some of the diaphragm walls, some of the panels. These two panels, number four and number eight, were fairly well instrumented with fiber optics. And so what that entails is some quite uh, clever thinking as to not disrupt the construction activity in any way. So these D walls are very deep, uh, a typical cage is only about 12 meters in height, so there are um, five such cages being lowered into the, into the D wall. And the way to do that and not incur the wrath of the contractors was to, was to have the optical fiber on, real, on, on um, cable drums. And so the cage would get lowered down into the uh, into the slurry field trench and the optical fibre would just be clipped to the cage as it went down. So it would be stopped and clipped to the cage. So here in fact is a view of just that operation happening. Inevitably it's usually late at night. These things often, often are. Uh, you can see the optical fibres being uncoiled from the cable drum here. And the way in which the fibre was designed was to give, um, to be on the both sides of the cage, so that you get absolutely the, the real bending moments uh, of the panels. That's the bending moment as the panels are trying to trying to uh, um, deform inwards towards the soil, and so those are uh, what we call the longitudinal reinforcement, the red ones on on the two sides of the cage. And we also, importantly, have temperature, the blue ones, because temperature is very important in, in this uh, uh, application. And very significantly, we also had radial reinforcement. Now, this was, re sorry, radial optical fiber, the green ones. And they were placed on the cage um, when the cage was being fabricated. So that, that then allows, essentially, the radial compressive strain and hence the compressive stresses to be measured for the very really much the first time. And the other ones enable the bending such as it might be. And I'm going to show you that the bending is actually extremely small, which is 
No real surprise, but you need to demonstrate this to start to convince people to design things differently. So this is um, showing the mechanical and the thermal-induced strain in a diaphragm wall. So this is the soil side over here. This is the excavation side. And the, the solid lines are the strain measured of both temperature and the mechanical strain. And the dashed lines are just the strain due to temperature. And that's the same. The light blue on this side is the same. And over here are two plots, one where the excavation depth within the shaft had got down to 19 metres and one where it got down to 33 metres. The important point just to highlight here is that there is very little difference between the blue, dark blue and the dashed blue or the light blue and the light dash blue. In other words, the principal strains that we're seeing here uh, are actually temperature and very, very small strains due to bending. Maybe no surprise that actually the, 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 in a circular shaft comprising D walls, the actual bending of the panels inwards is actually extremely small. And yet, the size of the reinforcement cages is enormous because the designers haven't got it in their heads that this is not a plain strain excavation. This is a circular shaft. Now, this, you may say, well, that's obvious, isn't it? But going back to Lord Kelvin, if you don't measure it and demonstrate it, you will never improve it. So, but the hoop strain, on the other hand, is very significant. And this is a plot of hoop strain. Um, neg negative is compression uh, with, uh, with depth, elevation down here. Uh, sorry, this is the elevation level. Uh, and, and what we're seeing here is the excavation depth plotted against the hoop strain. So the location of the cables in this case is at a depth we're talking about panel number eight here, at, of 30 meters. So at 30 meters, and what we're seeing here are the measured strains as the excavation um, increases all the way down here, right down, in fact, to, to over almost 60 meters, just, just above 60 meters. What you can see straight away is there's quite a lot of scatter, quite a lot of difference between the, the yellow ones are on the soil side and the diamond ones are on the excavation side. And there is a fair amount of difference. And we obviously spend a great deal of time looking at this and looking at the records of the, of the D-wall construction and so on. One of the explanations, not the only one, is that these D-walls, unsurprisingly, are not vertical. And so that you start to get some... some other effects coming in, especially deeper down. But I think what's interesting here is that the designer of the walls had done a plaxis prediction, a axisymmetric plaxis prediction, and that is shown in the dashed line. And it actually shows that the hoop strain and therefore the hoop compression is reasonably well predicted by the plaxis analysis. That's good. What isn't good is the huge amount of bending that was designed for. So, lessons learned from this small example uh, of shafts. Very important one, though. Fiber optics have been very successful in measuring the strains. The compressive hoop strains are much more significant than the longitudinal bending strains, which are very small. The reinforcement for longitudinal bending could be substantially reduced, and I think that's a very important design improvement. And temperature strains are more significant than bending strains. The next example of performance-based design improvements is with tunnels, and this is um, for Crossrail, now the Elizabeth Line, 
Most of you, I think, are familiar with Crossrail. I don't really need to describe in, in, in much detail here, except that the, the red, what you're seeing in red, uh, are all underground. Uh, underground stations and underground lines between the stations. And in particular, at Liverpool Street Station, there was the opportunity to understand much more about how sprayed concrete linings um, interact when there are multiple openings. And that you, you, will, you will see that, that here you've got the usual design of two platform tunnels with a central concourse tunnel and then cross passages connecting all three of those tunnels. So what this means is that uh, this, the, here is a better view of that. So here is the central concourse tunnel, the two platform tunnels, and the cross passages, one CP1, CP2. And this is excellent work uh, led by Nikki de Battista and other CSIC colleagues. Some terrific design work was done by Mott McDonald involving complicated three-dimensional finite element analysis of these junctions. Sprayed concrete is time-dependent, it's complex, and the soil properties are highly non-linear. And many, many assumptions have to go into this kind of analysis. You know, the properties of the, so the sprayed concrete, the properties of the soil. And what we set out to do was to measure exactly what really was happening. So this is a view of Nikki and, and uh, other CSIC colleagues placing fiber optics on the sprayed concrete after the first pass of the sprayed concrete. And there are going to be, this is quite a big tunnel, it's about 11 meters in diameter, and there are going to be cross passages, number one, number two, which are, in other words, big holes are going to be, going to be uh, broken out of the tunnel. And the question is, what does that do? We all kind of are familiar with the idea of stress concentrations, and if you have holes, um, you tend to concentrate stresses. So the upshot here, and I'm just summarizing this, this is a plan view. So here is the... Uh, the large 11 meter diameter tunnel in plan. Here are the two cross passages, one here and one over here. And what we found was that the localized strain was really confined just to the blue area, actually fairly, fairly locally around the holes. Whereas the finite element analyses and the design had called for thickening of the spray concrete over this whole distance here. In other words, for the whole red distance. This is important because these kind of um, openings in stations are, are pretty frequent. Uh, there, there'll be a lot of them. And so for the future, potential design improvements, we, can get a, we should be able to have much less material, less excavation, less time, and actually safer construction because sprayed concrete um, involves a degree of, of, of care needed to ensure absolute safety. So that's an example of another performance-based design improvement. And the third example I want to give you is, is of piled rafts. This is all of you here who've been involved in geotechnical engineering we'll still know that we still scratch our heads and worry about when you've got a piled raft, how much load is taken by the raft, how much is taken by the piles. It's, a, it's a, an endless source of discussion and it's a big conundrum. And this is a, an ongoing project right now that Cedric uh, is involved with. And this is a... Um, a building which will involve piles and a raft, and you can see that the, uh, the designer, and this is AKT2, uh, Dimitrios Salamitas, who's a former PhD student of this department, uh, of our group, and they are putting reinforcement on the top and the bottom of the raft to measure its bending, and putting reinforcement 
in the piles. And then the building will, will go up and all of this will be measured. And I think this is a, an absolutely superb example. We haven't seen the results yet. They're being obtained as we speak, actually. Um, so this is um, fixing rein, uh, fiber, fiber optics to the reinforcement cage. And that's another point I want to emphasize, that reinforcement cages are the perfect way, they're a perfect former for fixing fiber optic to. It's really dead easy. And, and uh, a pile cage is particularly easy to do that. And that's, the readings have been taken and, and I hope that uh, in a few months time we'll get some really exciting data. And the other point to make is that all of these cases I'm talking about form wonderful case histories, wonderful opportunities to back analyze, to test um, other design methods, to test final element analyses, but by providing the data, they provide really excellent case histories. And this is um, one of the cages just going into the pile and, and uh, then in a small porter cabin on the site is the, the readout units. Um, and, and Epsimon is a small spin-out company that spun out of CSIC. And uh, I think um, we'll get some very interesting data from that very shortly. So the next category I want to describe, having described performance-based design improvements, is construction control. Now here, uh, Nikki de Batista did some very nice work um, for a high-rise tower. And one of the things that was, was um, concerning the designers was the cladding. So as, as these buildings get constructed, they deform, they compress, and the cladding needs to fit exactly right. And so the way this was done was to monitor two of the uh, reinforced concrete columns, these two here and here, and some of the walls as well, over the full height of the building to measure the progressive axial shortening as this building was constructed. So it was constructed using an automated jump form. So it was a, a continuous automatic or automated process with spools of fiber optic, rather like I described for the D walls cages. So as, as the, the whole building was, was slowly going up, um, the fiber optic cables were attached to the cages and there was continuous measurement every 30 minutes of the strain and the temperature profile throughout the 17-month construction period. And the important point here is there were differences as the designers were worried about. And they were at least confirmed by these measurements because the, these, are, these are axial displacements in millimeters of those two columns, C9 and C8, um, against time. And one thing to immediately say is, is that thermal movement was significant. So, so often is the case that uh, unless you can actually understand the effect of thermal movements, um, John, you'll know this from Pisa, you'll know it from, from Big Ben, and all these structures. If you don't understand the temperature effects, then, then you, 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 they will mask the actual strains being induced by, by stresses. And so it was tremendously important data and really useful to, to, to the designers of the cladding to be able to work out exactly what allowance to make between the the, um, the different parts of the building to make sure the cladding fit, fitted absolutely perfectly. The next example I want to show is, is a recent one which Keith Bowers knows very well, um, the, the really iconic bank station capacity upgrade, which is a, a tremendously complex bit of tunneling um, 
right in the heart of the city, Bank Station, and the new tunnels are shown um, in purple here. The, the, the big new one here is, is a purple tunnel here. And there were two heritage buildings of particular importance. One is the Mansion House, uh, home of the Lord Mayor of London, and the other was St Mary Abchurch, which is positioned to one side. And I'm going to actually focus on St Mary Abchurch and some really excellent work by Sinan Asigog, who is, who is uh, one of our um, postdocs here. He's now at the University of Oxford. And this was a classic Wren church. Um, actually, it was very, quite, quite badly damaged in, in the Second World War. And the big tunnel was going pretty close to this church. So, again, what I'm showing, I hope, is, is that the power of, of advanced monitoring. Slight departure. This slide is not fibre optics. This is actually settlement monitoring of St Mary Ab Church. And just to show you that this is the vertical settlement uh, plotted in metres. So the maximum settlement was about 23 millimetres due to tunnelling uh, along a facade, a 20 metre long facade. And what this shows, interestingly, is the um, difference between laser scanning using um, this kind of technology here and conventional levelling points and prisms. So laser scanning, again, is a very powerful and extremely useful technique for measuring settlement. But that's a slight departure because what I'm really focusing on in this lecture is fibre optic monitoring. And if you look very carefully, you can see the fibre optic up here, another one along here, and another one on here. That's another big plus. They're very, very unobtrusive. When you're dealing with a heritage building, that's uh, important because you, you're up against people who don't want to have their building plastered with visually um, obvious instrumentation. And what this has enabled, what this allowed was then by having a top, middle and bottom, one was able to then calculate curvature and horizontal strain and understand in a much, much more comprehensive way how this whole building um, deformed and, and um, strained during the tunnelling. A, a, a great case history. It's been written up in, in a number of journals, including Geotechnique, quite recently. And this is the, the quality of the data, the quantity and the quality. So tensile strains are positive, and of course tensile strains are bad for masonry. Um, and you can see there is some quite significant um, tensile strain being developed. And in fact, there were some cracks caused by the tunnelling. Minor, but they were caused. But again, we can understand this much more now. There was a pilot tunnel first, and then the enlargement tunnel here. And this kind of data, again, is invaluable in understanding, again, as a case history, in understanding exactly how buildings before. This last example, I think, is um, the same project, the Bank Station project. This one really had a, a lot of people sitting, um, getting extremely worried, because here the tunnels had, there was no choice but to simply cut through some tunnel, some piles. And so uh, these were 50-year-old, unreinforced, under ream piles. Mark, you remember this. We, we talked about this in, the, in the, uh, the planning inquiry, when there was the owners of this building, quite reasonably, uh, were objecting to this. <laughs> um, and so some of these piles had to physically be cut, and, and there was no choice but to do that. This is a really excellent example of construction control and reassurance to the building owner and to the designers and to all the parties involved. So this was the way the cut pile was dealt with. Um, it's an excellent paper uh, by 
by uh, um, Barca of Arup. So the pile is going to be cut um, and then a, a transfer structure, quite a thick piece of concrete like this and the actual tunnel will be much smaller. So the actual tunnel will cut the pile uh, and then the transfer structure is built. The reason why this was very important was that it, this building was likely to be demolished and likely to, be, to have a much bigger building replacing it. And they wanted to make sure that the, the piles, the existing piles, could be used. So, this is, I think, absolutely where fibre optics came into their own. So, there was the opportunity for... This, is, this pile, number 14, was physically going to be cut. That's what it looked like, but that bit was going to be removed completely, in the tunnel. This pile was going to be marginally interfered with, but only marginally. Both piles were accessible from the raft, and so it was possible to core down both piles and install fibre optics. And that is a view of this tunnel when this pile was just being exposed. And if you look very carefully, you can see four prisms here and here because that is where the cut is going to be. So that's simply going to be cut off, removed. And the fibre optics in the pile would then tell the designers, the tunnel constructors, telling everybody exactly what was going to happen. This is Cedric, the marvellous Cedric, who sadly is not here today. Uh, that's him um, putting the fibre optics down into the pile, um, down to a considerable depth, down to about 19 metres below the, the top here. And this is the kind of data you get. So now we're looking at the two piles, the fully intercepted one, the one that's been cut, and the partially intercepted one, the one just down at the bottom. The strain, uh, these are strain changes, and uh, negative is compression strain, positive is tensile strain. So the one that's been partially intercepted is actually experiencing some negative skin friction effects. It's actually increasing the compression uh, in the pile, not by a great deal, but it is increasing the compressive strain. But the other one that's been cut is rather, unha rather unhappy, um, and this is what happened. A crack appeared in it, and it's, it's fine, but it is a crack, and what you can actually, these are different times here. I don't expect you to examine all of these dates, but what actually is happening here is a crack uh, it, it's all subject to tensile strain, so when it was cut, that actually caused the pile to go into tension. And indeed it cracked. 300 microstrain was enough to crack it. But actually, later, the crack closed up somewhat. And this kind of data is just invaluable. And the, this is more detail of that same pile, P14. So these are strain changes here. Remember that positive is tensile strain. So this is the pile cutting. You can see some quite dramatic things happening here. And then there is the building of the load transfer structure. You can see some changes going on. So the tensile strain is reducing somewhat. And over here, we have the actual vertical movement. So the pile that we're looking at two lines here, the dashed line, which is the movement of the pile at the top in the basement, and the solid line is the movement of the pile at the tunnel level. And you can see that there is a, uh, at the bottom, you can see a big change here. And the pile settled about four millimetres. But all of this was reassuring. 
It meant that everything was going to plan. It meant that the tunneling was, didn't have to be modified. So from the point of view of construction control, from the point of view of reassuring designers, it was exactly the kind of measurement needed. So now I'm going to switch subject to the third category, performance of existing infrastructure assets. And many of you uh, will know that we have an awful lot of bridges in the UK made of masonry. 18,000 bridges constructed of masonry in pretty uncertain condition. And there have been cases of partial masonry bridge collapses. And so there is a, a real need to understand more about these existing um, very important um, infrastructure assets. They are vulnerable. So today, axle loads are two to three times higher than they were in Victorian times when most of those bridges were built. The train cars are often twice as long. Often the bridges are noticeably in poor condition. And there are needs nowadays for speed restrictions for such bridges. So a particular case in point was at Leeds, Leeds Station, Mainline Station, where the viaduct was in pretty ropey condition, at least visually. And there, there were speed restrictions on all the trains coming in and leaving the station because of that. And so CSIC, in conjunction with Network Rail, put some fibre optic into the, uh, onto these structures, onto these viaducts. This is a sort of, this is why there was cause for concern. This is, you know, cracks, disfigured, not very, not terribly confidence boosting uh, site. The masonry looks pretty ropey. So this was the way in which um, fiber optic was placed um, and it enabled the dynamic strain to be measured and to understand the, the load flow when trains run over the viaduct. It, was, it enabled bending strains. It, it enabled the cracks, the existing cracks, to be understood as they opened and closed. But here's the important point. These fiber optic sensors showed that actually, despite its appearance, the masonry viaduct was doing the job perfectly well. And the speed restrictions that had been in place were no longer necessary. And indeed, there had been contemplation of replacing the entire viaduct on the basis of its visual condition. So this, I think, is another very important aspect of fiber optic sensing to measure and to demonstrate that existing assets, how they're performing, and whether or not they actually do need to be repaired, replaced, um, or in some way modified. And then the other example is a brand new bridge, uh, the West Coast Main Line, constructed by Langer Rourke. Um, this is one of two bridges. One was a steel bridge, the other was a pre-stressed concrete bridge. And this had a whole lot of fiber optics incorporated in the bridge deck, um, which were, because it was a modular construction, they were able to be placed uh, during the factory, during the manufacture of the beams in the factory. And this is a fantastic case history of, of how such a modern bridge performs when trains are running across it. You get terabytes of data from, from uh, the fiber optics. And again, demonstrating to what extent the bridge is over-designed over and what design improvements can be made in the future. But this is a very good example of an asset that's going to have um, fiber optic monitoring for its life. It's been so designed that it can be, throughout its life, it can, it can be regularly checked. Switching to another example, CERN in, the, in, in Geneva. This is um, probably, you're familiar with this, but there are 83 kilometers of tunnel uh, for, the, for the collider beams. Um, 
very complicated to access because they're most of the time having these um, beams flying around inside them. They're quite old, some of them. Some of them are going back almost 50 years. They are in a ground condition called molasses, which is a rather complicated swelling mudstone. And one of our excellent PhD students, Vanessa Di Morrow, uh, under Kenichi Soga's supervision, she went and attached um, at a time when the tunnels were accessible, and they're only accessible for a very short period in a year, attached fiber optics to really understand why it was that one of these tunnels was deforming and indeed showing cracks. And it enabled continuous strain measurements remotely without any access needed and radiation resistant, which is particularly important for this application, because there are no electronics involved. A glass fiber is inert, doesn't require any electronics, and it's long distance. So you can, I mentioned at, at the outset, that these fiber optics can be um, hundreds of meters, if not kilometers long, and you, distance is not a problem. There's another example of, of an asset that's now being watched very carefully with, with, the, with the fiber optics installed on that asset to establish just what it's doing, how much it's changing, whether any action is needed. And the final category of the four categories I want to, to talk about is the early warning detection. Again, using fiber optic sensing. So, um, the Huli railway cutting. Uh, some of you may know this. These are some old photographs shown on the left. This is a steep, deep cutting in chalk. Uh, the Victorian engineers, let's face it, were quite, were quite brave. And they, and they constructed you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles of railway in days when perhaps not quite so much geotechnical engineering was understood. And they cut sometimes very steep slopes. And then they built houses right up to the edge of the slope. So, so that here's a kind of real problem of, of, of con continuous instability of the chalk uh, with, with falls, which are obviously potentially very dangerous if they were to cause um, a derailment. And so what's been done there is to attach fiber optic cables to the rock fall mesh. So there is a mesh which you can barely see to prevent the larger pieces of chalk coming down onto the line. But there was still a question of how do we know how much that mesh is being used? And is there a, a dangerous um, situation where the, the, a lot of instability has happened and the mesh might actually be overstressed and might actually break? So you can see some very brave abseiling engineers here. These are not from CSIC, I hasten to say but these were from, from the contractor we were working very closely with. And the fiber optics, you can see the mesh over here, and the fiber optic has been um, uh, attached to that mesh and fixed also to some ground anchors drilled into the face. So again, this is, a, this is now a very nice example of, it's an operating system. The, if, if there is an overstressing indicated by the fiber optic, it immediately gets um, relayed to the relevant people. And to take that a bit further, what CSIC have now done is to collaborate with Huska, who manufacture um, geogrids. And we've actually incorporated fiber optic sensing cable into the geogrid itself. So the geogrid is now manufactured with fiber optic cable in there. And some really excellent work by Xiaomin Xu and, and Cedric and, and uh, David Wright from Jacobs and a number of others have really, I think, made a, a really interesting breakthrough here to produce a, a geogrid for ground movement detection which has fiber optic ready-made in it. And so this is being tested uh, at the Tal 
house lane cutting um, for HS2. And in this part of HS2, which is near the Chilterns, uh, there are concerns about stability. You can see over here stability of some temporary cut slopes and actually with construction traffic, some sinkhole appearances. And so what this is, has, has, uh, this is an experimental um, new form of testing where the geogrid has been laid out for um, about 100 metres in length, it's 10 metres wide, and it's got fibre optic incorporated in it. And uh, this is hugely, hugely important in, in enabling risk of sinkholes to, that, that might, might be troublesome, because if a sinkhole appears, it's obviously a fairly dramatic um, event, but more often than not, there is some indication some indication of instability before the, the main sinkhole to, um, actually develops. So this is ongoing measurement, I think with huge promise for as an early warning system for all sorts of applications, whether it be slopes or sinkholes, um, a geogrid with a ready-made fibre optic in it has got huge potential. And then I also should mention other forms of detection than fibre optics. And there are a huge, huge interest in wireless sensors and huge interest in satellite technology. So many of you may remember that in August 2020, there was a tragic uh, derailment uh, in Scotland, in Stonehaven, which is very near Carmont, uh, where a train hit a whole lot of debris on, on the line and was derailed and people were killed. And it was a, a real wake-up call. It had happened, in fact, um, after a very dry, it was in August, an extremely dry um, few months, um, so cracks open in the slope, and then huge downpours of rain. So a real example of climate change. Huge, huge, uh, unusually downpours of rain and the, the uh, debris, the instability that took place led to a train hitting it. Uh, I was asked to chair a review of Network Rail's earthworks management. And I'm just going to show you some, some of the power of other things in fiber optic sensing. So this is some really interesting work done in the Netherlands on their railway network. So they are using satellite technology to measure movement, vertical movement. And they, and they can get probably within perhaps two or three millimeters of accuracy now. And what we're looking at here, in fact, the, the red areas are where the settlement has exceeded 10 millimeters per year. So there is ongoing the Netherlands has some very soft soil and they've got all sorts of um, events and things going on that are causing onward, uh, ongoing settlement. And the blue actually are some heave measurements, which are a bit more interesting as to why the heave was taking place. But the reason for just showing you this is it seems to me this is an extremely powerful technique that we're, we're hearing more about uh, in SAR, um, the... the, the the capability of satellites to be able to, sh to make measurements of movement uh, on a regular basis as they fly over has got enormous potential. And one of our recommendations in our report for the government for Network Rail was to make more use of satellite technology. And the um, other thing that I mentioned is wireless sensors around a tunnel portal. So these are wireless sensors, which are um, actually by Sensive. Sensive were industry partners of CSIC. And these are, uh, a lot of the instability that network rail experience are around tunnel portals. And so here is an array of wireless sensors around a tunnel portal, which 
is, 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 has some pretty steep slopes around it. And climate change, transport, infrastructure resilience is a problem we're facing more and more. You know, we're seeing lots of really bad things happen to our own infrastructure. And this one in particular, Tadcaster, was a masonry bridge that collapsed under flooding um, in 2015. And, and the excellent work by Sakti Selva Kumaran, who I think is here, uh, she was a part of CSIC, she's in the Cambridge group, and Cam Middleton was supervising her. This is a really, really interesting example of the power of satellite observations. So what we're looking at here are movements in millimetres against time. And the red line is the one I want you to concentrate on. The red line was measurements made um, right up to about the 4th of November 2015. There were small movements, perhaps of the order of a millimetre. But then something really quite dramatic happened. And the 29th of December, so that's six weeks later, the bridge collapsed. And it's very clear from the satellite measurements that there was serious indication for weeks before that collapse that something wasn't going well. And almost certainly it was a scour that caused it, scour of the, of the foundations of the bridge, but the, there had been minor flooding, uh, still fairly significant flooding, in the weeks leading up to it. And the minor flooding was causing scour, which was causing some movement of that bridge. So this kind of observation uh, to, to, to measure what is happening to our existing infrastructure is a, as, a, as a warning system is, again, very powerful. Now, I, I've moved away from fiber optics just for these two examples to, 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 to say that, that, that wireless sensors and INSAR data, satellite data, have got enormous potential. So, I'm going to summarize now. Um, firstly, to say that fiber optic sensor monitoring, I hope I've conveyed the message, has a huge potential for strain measurement for many, many areas of infrastructure. The four areas I focused on, performance-based design improvements. And I talked about, I gave some examples of shafts, tunnels, piled rafts. Construction control, high-rise building, I gave an example of that. The pile interception one, which has to be one of the more dramatic um, uh, examples. And heritage buildings, the performance of heritage buildings during tunneling. The performance of existing assets, so bridges, the CERN tunnels. That's also another uh, great value of fiber optic sensing. And early warning detection, so railway cutting, stability, sinkholes. So these four categories, I believe, are absolutely invaluable examples of where fiber optic sensing can really be uh, of, of, huge, of huge importance. And there's also great potential, which I only just touched on, for wireless sensors and satellite technology. So, to conclude, I hope that I've demonstrated, and I hope CSIC has demonstrated over the last 13 years or so, that sensors and smart infrastructure really deliver value when they are exploited for managing assets throughout their life, whether they be roads, tunnels, bridges, buildings, sewers, flood defences, you name it, there is enormous, enormous value. Um, it enables a complete understanding of the performance of assets. Remember what Lord Kelvin said, if you don't measure it, how can you possibly tell how those assets are performing? All too often one talks to, to a, a proud engineer uh, and you ask them how is their new bridge, their new flood defence performing, and they say, well, it's, it's built, it's working. We should measure how they're working. And it allows 
I think, greater efficiencies in design and performance and, importantly, rational strategies for whole life maintenance and asset management. And the last and probably most important point, there really is a vital importance of data to maximise the efficiency of new infrastructure and existing infrastructure. We really need to fully exploit the digital transformation that our world is seeing. And I go back to Lord Kelvin just to remind you one more time that if we don't measure things, we will never improve them. I hope that I've been able to answer the question in the title of my lecture. And my final reflection, I thank Jennifer, because Jennifer and, and uh, Ajit Palikad and other industry colleagues wrote an excellent paper on smart infrastructure. And it said, smart infrastructure will shape a better future. Greater understanding of the performance of our infrastructure will allow new infrastructure to be designed and delivered more efficiently and to provide better whole life value. Change is inevitable, progress is optional. Now is the time for the infrastructure industry to choose to be smart. And I couldn't agree more with those words. So I have many people to thank, too, too many, um, apart from Jennifer, who's been a fabulous director of CSIC, but also our many, many industry partners. And so on this slide are three groups of our industry partners, are the infrastructure clients, the owners, the operators, the consultants, the contractors, the asset managers, and the technology and information supply chain. These are all absolutely invaluable supporters of CSIC. Without them, Without you, CSIC would not have been as successful as it has been. Thank you all very much.